picture is worth a thousand words. Ever since the invention of photography, we've been blessed or cursed with images that our ancestors could never have possibly imagined. From family photographs to disturbing, horrific photographs from crime scenes, an infinity of photographs have been taken since the 19th century. Throughout recent history, countless images have become infamous, but more remain undetected, hidden away with the cracks of time. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three rare photographs from the past and the stories behind them. Mad Jack Churchill We often see photographs from days gone by, of people from another time wondering about their lives and what they accomplished in their life. Mad Jack Churchill being among such individuals. He led a legendary life, a motorcyclist, adventurer, surfer, plus a few more. Any officer who goes into action without his sword is improperly dressed, he was recorded saying. His real name was Lieutenant Colonel John Churchill, but most knew him as Mad Jack. According to sources, he would bring a Scottish broadsword with him into battle during the Second World War. Mad Jack had a dislike for modern weapons such as rifles and tanks, opting instead for a traditional means of melee combat. He used his sword and even his longbow during the war. Churchill was born in Hong Kong in the early 20th century, to the director of public works in Hong Kong, Alec Churchill. The family lived there until 1917. It was during his childhood in Asia that his passion for adventure sparked, spending his youth exploring the cities and rural towns. This passion didn't fade when the family returned to England. Instead, it only grew. In 1926, he graduated from the Royal Military College in Sandhurst, joining the Manchester Regiment, which made him move to Burma. He spent most of his free time travelling around the country and experiencing everything he could. Moving to explore Kenya in 1936, where he even dabbled in acting. Soon thereafter, he had to pause his thirst for exploration and adventure as World War II exploded. He returned to his post in the British Army fighting in France. Due to his peculiar choice of weapon, he achieved the title of being the only British soldier to slay the enemy using a longbow. Churchill accompanied the commandos, a special force unit created to raid against the Germans who occupied territories of Europe. Churchill was a living legend, and claims of him playing the bagpipes and throwing grenades into battle were abundant, as he earned the name of Mad Jack. For his extraordinary efforts, he was gifted the military cross and bar. He evidently enjoyed his time in the war, despite having been captured by the German powers twice, and said to have played the bagpipes throughout his time in the services. He proceeded to join the Highland Light Infantry in British-occupied Palestine, where he assisted with the rescue and evacuation attempts for the country's civilians. After his increasing age became noticeable, he moved to Australia and taught as a military instructor until he retired entirely from the army in 1959. Despite his middle age, the craziness didn't cease. He spent the remainder of his days surfing, sailing the Thames, playing with model warships and enjoying his life, whilst confusing those around him with his eccentric personality. He passed away at the age of 89. Miscorrect Posture It's said that the past is another country, they do things differently there. This is even true when it comes to more recent history, such as the 1950s. Things that were once considered normal now spark confusion and distaste in our modern hearts. Beauty contests still exist. However, during the 1950s and 1960s, there was a fad for posture contests. In the early 19th century, the United States took an interest in chiropractors and the study of posture. The profession was still in its humble beginnings, and as a way of spreading popularity and gaining public interest in the research, prominent chiropractors of the time decided to begin a series of beauty contests to legitimise their vocation, obtain sponsorship or sell contemporary beauty products, but to show renowned doctors this practice was valid. These pageants had several names throughout the years, but miscorrect posture was the most commonly used. In Chicago, during the spring of 1956, 
there was a seven-day-long convention for chiropractors. At this week-long event, there was a beauty contest, meant to highlight the doctoral practice in glamorised light. The winner of this contest was an 18-year-old girl by the name of Lois Conway. The Chicago Tribune talked about the way the winners were chosen, explaining their x-rays and standing posture were heavily judged on top of their conventional beauty. Every contestant had to stand on a pair of scales, and the winning trio, first, second, and third place winners, were the ladies who were equally beautiful in the face and body as their weight spread perfectly from one foot to the other. The best posture, it was said, was the kind where your body weight is perfectly split from one to the other. These contests continued to happen for two decades, spreading through the United States like a wildfire. Connecticut, Salt Lake City, Alabama, Washington, miscorrect posture pageants took the country by storm, even being discussed in the weekly newspaper columns and popular magazines. The largest recorded posture pageant was in 1969, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. There, a certain chiropractor by the name of Dr. Hug stated that these beauty showcases served their purpose ideally. They were never meant to live long, and were, after all, a scheme to raise awareness, and that's exactly what happened. They concluded in the 1970s when their popularity plummeted, and the world moved on to other trends. Race organisers attempt to stop Catherine Switzer from competing in the Boston Marathon. The stories behind photographs are often fascinating, if not disturbing or infuriating. In the case of this particular story, it's the latter. Catherine Switzer was an extremely talented author, commentator, and marathon runner during the 1960s and 1970s. In fact, Switzer was the very first woman in the history of Boston to be a registered competitor in the city's 1967 marathon. At the time, women's sports were a heated subject, with many men believing women shouldn't compete in their activities, sports, and marathons. Switzer was the daughter of a major from the United States Army, having been born in Germany and spent her early childhood there. Later in her youth, her family moved back to America. She attained education at Lynchburg College in 1967, earning a bachelor's and master's degree in English and literature and journalism by 1972. Though men claimed women were too delicate for the brutality of sports, Switzer persevered. Despite her trainer's Arnie Briggs' claim that she was a fragile woman, he agreed to let her test her abilities. He promised that if she managed to run the marathon's length in practice, he would bring her to the Boston Marathon of 1967. She was successful in this endeavour, and Briggs kept his end of the bargain, bringing her with him to Boston. The pair checked the official rule book, and after noticing there was no mention of gender, so no rule stating she couldn't compete, she registered with her AAU number paid the race fee, and acquired the necessary certificate of fitness, following every rule to a T. Her father and boyfriend were both extremely supportive of her attempts, and did their best to spark enthusiasm in her despite the oppressive circumstances of her situation. Her desire to succeed made her the first woman to ever compete in a Boston Marathon. It didn't come without a price. During the run, the race manager, Jock Stemple, attempted to forcibly remove her bib to have her disqualified. Consistently, he tried to physically assault her until Briggs and Thomas Miller, her boyfriend, shoved the man to the ground as a way of protecting her from his malicious intentions and sexist views. Despite Semple's efforts, Switzer completed the marathon as the number 261. Though she achieved the unimaginable, her victory resulted in a tragedy. The AUU, appalled with her actions and taking Semple's side, officiated a ban for all women, not allowing them to participate in any marathons or sporting events until 1972. Semple claimed her allowance in the marathon was an error and an oversight, and the sports industry vehemently agreed with his claims. Women can't run in the marathon because the rules forbid it. Unless we have rules, society will be in chaos. I don't make the rules, but I try to carry them out. We have no space in the marathon for an unauthorised person, even a man. If that girl were my daughter, I would spank her, said one of the marathon organisers. In her memoirs, Switzer wrote, I knew if I quit, nobody would ever believe that women had the capability to run 26 plus miles. If I quit, everybody would say it was a publicity stunt. 
If I quit, it would set women's sports back, way back, instead of forward. If I quit, I'd never run Boston. If I quit, Jock Semple and all those like him would win. My fear and humiliation turned to anger. Indeed, a photograph says a thousand words, and yet what often remains unsaid is worth finding out. Stories hidden behind these images we see scattered around the internet are often worth discovering, for they hold crucial, covered fragments of our human history. So what do you make of these three photos that hold a rare historical story? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community whilst working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.